All right. So welcome, everyone. Uh, we appreciate you uh, carving out some time on a, a, a rare stretch of beautiful weather here in Pittsburgh. Uh, hopefully, uh, things are well wherever you're joining us from. Uh, appreciate folks dropping uh, some names and locations in from uh, into the chat. Uh, definitely encourage folks to use the chat actively during this webinar uh, to give you a little sense of, of what we're going to be uh, really striving for today. Uh, we're going to be unpacking uh, issues of or concepts of knowledge, social, and creative capital, and really thinking more about how to leverage those and, and where we may uh, have gaps and how they've maybe held back the social sector to date. Uh, we want to introduce this idea of an actionable data model and thinking more about how uh, data doesn't just inform us, but how it actually turns around into to actions that uh, improve our impact and our effectiveness. And uh, lastly, which is the, I think the, the lead here is, is to really share uh, what we've been working on with partners uh, around the power in numbers, uh, what we're calling 2.0, which is essentially a, a release of an updated uh, technology platform and introducing our creative advocacy playbook, uh, which we're really excited to talk more about as well. A few things to expect. We uh, will, at uh, the end of sort of an intro here, we'll have a short breakout uh, time where uh, we'll have uh, folks will have a chance to, to meet with each other. So if you're able to hop on camera, if you're able to unmute, yeah, you might want to keep those functions within reach uh, so you can interact a bit. Uh, we have a number of guest appearances that are going to be uh, popping up throughout the, the conversation. So uh, hopefully you won't get too uh, sick of my voice by the end of this, but it's really through our partners that this work exists in the first place. It's the people and communities we support that inform how and where we move this initiative forward and inviting a number of them to join us today uh, felt uh, like the best thing we could do. And um, at the end, we'll conclude with uh, uh, some Q&A and you know, a larger group chat if, if folks have time to stick around. Um, so again, please uh, use the chat liberally. Uh, the new Sun Rising team is, is monitoring and will respond to things. Uh, we'll do our best to, to share some links and other things along the way uh, to cover some of the topics that we'll be, we'll be going through. Um, and at the bottom, if, if you hear anything today that is really inspiring, or if you want to connect further, please get to us at info at newsunrising.org. Um, it's not news to anyone on this in this meeting uh, that we're living in a time of historic transition. Uh, we know things are changing rapidly and significantly. Um, so it's the pace and the scale of change that's that's uh, you know really historic. Um, Social innovation, uh, work driven by nonprofits, social enterprises, has the potential to lead this transformation of how our systems work in a more equitable and sustainable way. Um, I know all of us work hard. Uh, you know, all of our, our nonprofits typically are under resourced. Uh, a lot of the community driven work that we're supporting, um, and everyone's doing good work, but we have to face the reality that the social work, social sector has a lot of work to do uh, for us to reach our full potential. If we are going to, to lead and, and really shape this transformation uh, that we're living in. Um, the other caveat that I'd like to acknowledge before we get started is that the work being shared today, it is imperfect, it is incomplete, and it's very much in its early stages. Uh, we invite you all to help us shape this and test it, uh, improve the tools that we're working on, help us understand ways that we can work uh, in the spaces and, and ways that, that you're pursuing as well. And again, using that info at New Sun Rising is the best way to, to stay engaged. Um, lastly, before we jump in, I just wanted to uh, state again with, with all the heaviness uh, that we're experiencing and feeling in so many places in our communities right now, um, the removal of, of personal and civil, liber civil liberties, um, you know, challenges to our ability to you know, 
even acknowledge our history um, and reckon with that history and our abilities to, you know, really live in our full, the fullness of our own identities, uh, whatever they may be. Uh, it can get heavy and it has been heavy. Um, I just want to share a moment of gratitude uh, as well, though, to, to really um, seat this work in, you know, what I think is a hopeful future. And I want to offer uh, our sincere appreciation for all of the, the hundreds of community members, organizations, project leaders that have uh, contributed to the development of this platform, both directly and indirectly. Um, our experience, uh, like any teacher, um, you are the student as well. And so we learn so much from everyone we work with, whether we're uh, delivering a product or service or whether we're partnering um, and you know we offer our sincere gratitude as as the roots of a lot of what we'll be sharing today uh, more specifically i'd like to call out a civic mapper who's been a our, our lead development partner has really uh, done so much with so little uh, to help us get to the point that, that we're at today uh, with the vibrancy portal uh, the project started with a Carnegie Mellon University student group called SUDS and a vibrancy fellowship that we had, had kicked off uh, a few years ago. Uh, we've been uh, talking with Pitt and their uh, center for um, uh, Cassie um, and uh, a lot of funders, the Pittsburgh Foundation, Google through the Tides Foundation, the Heron Foundation, Henry L. Hillman Foundation, and the Hopper Dean Foundation all have been critical to us establishing uh, what we've been able to do here. Um, I'd also just note as a, as a nod towards uh, unrestricted income, uh, we wouldn't be able to do this tech development and this exploratory work around creative advocacy if New Sun Rising was not able to generate some of our own restrict, unrestricted income, uh, which gives us a lot of that flexibility to, to, to do research and development and test things. So uh, just a nod for the nonprofits out there uh, looking to diversify and the importance of those uh, strategic benefits of being able to take risks. Uh, and lastly, uh, for those of you that know me, um, you know, I really lean on uh, who I feel is the greatest teacher uh, that we can and that's uh, nature and the earth. So I express my gratitude for um, all of our natural uh, systems and, and all the wisdom that they bring to us as well. So um, with that, uh, talking a little bit about New Sun Rising, um, this is our Vibrant Communities Manifesto, uh, really just incorporates who we are, uh, our culture, the way that we operate. Um, you know, really doing hands-on deep work with uh, folks to establish trust, um, you know, figuring out how and where we, we can fit in with them and then uh, taking action. And again, sometimes that action is, is imperfect, but we really believe in learning by doing. Um, we have increasingly, especially through the pandemic, been recognizing the importance of, of the well-being of the people behind this work. We get so caught up in organizations and institutions and systems and we fail to recognize that uh, the infrastructure of all of this are people and um, our, our well-being uh, has a lot to do with the well-being and the, the, the ability of our organizations to operate fully. Um, taking a loving orientation to the work, thinking about how and where that shows up in your relationships. Uh, a lot of what today is seated in organizing people, money, data to really generate power and acknowledging the power imbalances that lead to a lot of, of the struggles that we're, we're dealing with. Um, and that uh, a lot of the complexity in the system work uh, can be solved through greater connectivity and stronger connectivity. Um, and we really, again, back to that idea of action, uh, really feel that uh, sitting still is not an option. This next part of the manifesto really just talks a bit about how we operationalize that. Uh, we look at uh, our areas of, uh, of development for any project or organization. Um, we uh, have that bucket around ignite, launch, and grow. Uh, we look at systemic impacts um, in these three areas, people will call it the triple bottom line. We call them culture, sustainability, and opportunity. Um, 
And all of this uh, really wrapped up in the bottom of this manifesto, um, which is our commitment to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and thinking how access, ownership, and dignity show up uh, in all of the, the spaces and ways that we work. Um, and so, you know, many of you that have worked with New Sun Rising over the years know that we're a moving target. Uh, sometimes we're hard to explain and uh, maybe hard to pin down at times. Uh, this complexity of the systems that we work in and the adaptability of, of our structure and processes um, really uh, are why we're designed the way we are um, to really help emerging solutions and to be as adaptive and responsive as possible. So with that, I'd like to start uh, our exploration by reflecting on uh, some of my own memorable experiences with data and then inviting you to do the same. Um, and so uh, some folks may, uh, may or may not recognize what's on the slide here. Um, 1983, uh, I am nine years old sitting on the carpeted floor of my living room with my brother, Brian, who many of you know, he would have been seven at that time. And we competed at everything. Uh, on the screen in front of us, uh, you know, one of the RCA old console TVs that you know, was a piece of furniture in and of itself is what I feel was the greatest game ever made for the Atari 2600, uh, Super Challenge Football. And uh, we played that game into the ground. Um, but for me, something was missing. Um, from game to game, I wanted to know how, whether I was improving or not. And we could look at the sco scoreboard, but that nine-year-old competitor in me really needed more. And uh, it was then that I started probably one of the most annoying habits that my brother would, would point to in our youth. Um, after every play, I would stop and write down the yardage that the players had uh, either gained or lost. And I calculated them at the end of the games. And uh, the games took longer. Brian wasn't having as much fun, but I could tell how our players and teams performed uh, game to game, season to season. And that was my first memory of what I would say is the power of numbers. Uh, you know, we called that information statistics at the time. Um, but moving forward, uh, these themes sort of uh, came up for me uh, time and time again. And so in uh, 1995, uh, carefully wading through the streams outside of Ohio University in southwestern Ohio, Athens, um, observing water striders uh, floating and dancing across the surface of the water, noting the conditions of their environments, uh, they were inhabiting fast or slow water, uh, and then going back to the lab and identifying their limb length, their torso size, their sex, and trying to figure out what the connection between these were. Um, this experience in, in field ecology uh, really furthered my curiosity around adaptive development, ecosystems, and the power of observation and of listening, deep listening. Um, it was this study of nature that really shaped my respect for the power of environmental conditions, uh, and not just natural, but the environmental conditions that all living things exist within. Uh, and we look at that as uh, collectively as data. And then lastly, the, the, the final reflection, uh, and I promise I'll get off Scott's history world tour here. Uh, 2003, um, visiting 30 homes each week, sitting on the couches and beds of elders as a physical therapist. Uh, which is my, my prior occupation, and learning to understand the conditions of those clients, um, adapting my strategies to help reach their goals, and something we forget about in uh, the healthcare industry um, is in order to get paid, we needed to submit documentation about the information related to each client. And this was structured as what we called a SOAP note, uh, subjective, objective assessment and plan. Um, and, and I think about that, that experience in particular uh, with the healthcare industry led me to really understand uh, the importance of measurement and, and the concept of what gets measured gets managed. Um, you know, in that case, uh, it also meant if we didn't measure it, uh, we didn't get paid. <laughs> which was, was a, another motivating factor. So 
with those three uh, trips down memory lane, um, really want to just invite folks here as I reflected on my own relationship with the concept of information. Uh, we'll use this as the basis to uh, have you all uh, just jump into some brief breakouts. Uh, there are there's an amazing group of people uh, that that responded to this. Uh, funders, thought leaders, uh, entrepreneurs, nonprofit uh, directors, community um, advocates and activists, artists. Um, I, I'd really enjoy if, if you had a chance to at least meet some new folks, uh, share a bit about yourself in an intro. And uh, similar to myself, if you can think back the first time that the concept of information or data or statistics came into your life and you know, what was your what was your feeling about that at the time? Uh, so Dan's going to go ahead and uh, move you into small groups, and we'll see you on the other side. All right, I'll assume everyone's landed safely here. Uh, see many smiling faces. Hey, this is the first time I'm seeing everyone. Hey, Will. Hey, Sarah. Hi, Sophie. Dan, uh, party. Watch party. <laughs> um, Martin, Peter, good to see you. Sorry, I promise I won't go through everyone's name, but these are the folks that are on my screen. Good to see you all. Uh, so I know more time in breakout rooms. That's always always the, the curse of these meetings. Uh, never enough time with good people. Uh, promise we'll, we'll give you an excuse to get back together again and we'll, we'll dive deeper. Um, so let's, let's move forward. Um, the world as we know uh, that we, we live in here is um, massively complex. It's nuanced. There is so much information uh, being created. Uh, and we also know that not only is this massive amount of information being created, but the, the conditions and influences around that are dynamic as well. Uh, right? They're constantly changing. And so many of us feel like the world is happening to us, uh, a sense of being overwhelmed, too many decisions to make. Um, over time, this contributes to a feeling of hopelessness and that, uh, you know, people primarily have come to, to depend on institutions outside of their community uh, for most of the things that they, they need health, education, financial opportunity, a lot of these uh, systems have become systems of dependency as opposed to uh, you know, spaces where communities can actually self-direct. If anyone knows what a Zetabyte is, uh, put a little icon on your, your screen, you'll, you'll win a prize. Um, this number of uh, 64.2 zettabytes is the amount of data uh, created and replicated last, I'm sorry, in 2022 or 2020. And so the, the amount of storage is the equivalent to 16 trillion DVDs. And as we know, that's just a, par a parabolic growth. Uh, the amount of data that's being created, stored, replicated, um, for reference, this is actually a tenfold increase from that number in 2012. Uh, and this amount is actually expected to triple again uh, before 2025. And so without belaboring the point, lots of data, only getting more, uh, how and where are we participating and uh, benefiting from that in the social sector. We also know that uh, systems themselves um, are uh, largely influenced by uh, different people, communities, and, and different levels within those communities. And so uh, these, again, areas of culture, sustainability, and opportunity, uh, we have associated the sustainable development goals. So some people may recognize these icons. They're global goals that touch on things like hunger and poverty, uh, equity, education, climate action. Uh, 
we've used these to make sense of what this triple bottom line means for us. And uh, the effect on these goals, the effect on the systems that drive these goals come from a lot of different um, spaces. We know that institutions have a big impact, corporations, government, academic, health systems, uh, small to mid-sized organizations and intermediaries, and the communities, uh, of course, themselves. Uh, but overwhelmingly, institutions hold the, the most economic and, and uh, social power within these systems. Um, their growth is increasingly driven by data, and they use that data uh, to drive narratives, improve their operations, be more competitive for financial resources and uh, communications insights. And largely, the incentives are to maintain power structures within these ecosystems. Uh, so uh, the question uh, becomes, um, oops, sorry, um, how can we help communities to lead and benefit from the futures that they envision, uh, as opposed to this being something that happens to them, how can we help them both lead and benefit from the future that they envision? Uh, in academia and in business, we've heard a lot about human-centered design as a people uh, centered approach, people first approach. In social innovation, uh, we often see these approaches instigated by smaller grassroots, community led nonprofits and uh, enterprises. Um, we also know that research shows that organizations that have higher data cultures are more effective and they have a greater impact. Uh, this is research done by partners of ours uh, who I've had the pleasure of spending some time with uh, Sherry Cheney Jones and the group at Measurement Resources, really showing that when communities and organizations absorb or adopt higher data cultures, meaning they collect, talk about, and make it a regular part of their operations, it influences them in, in many, many ways. Um, may not be surprising. I was really, uh, motivated by the amount of difference there is in high data culture organizations. And so, unfortunately, uh, we know that uh, for social innovation to grow, um, you know, there needs to be investment in data and communications and the ability to engage with the, the, the world around us. Unfortunately, uh, these more socially innovative organizations um, lack this critical capacity. Uh, our own research, research showed that 80% of leaders placed a high value on these things, but only 17% of them are reported receiving funding. Um, and so this lack of capacity really restricts their ability to compete for resources and participate in this uh, community transformation. And so uh, with that, we're going to uh, invite our first guest for today. Uh, Christine Kroger of Neighborhood North. Um, Christine has been a, a partner through our uh, relationships with our, our friends out in Beaver County, uh, uh, particularly Riverwise, but Christine has also participated in our nonprofit resilience program. And uh, we've done some, some data storytelling uh, work with supporting uh, them as well. So Christine, if you would uh, be so kind as to introduce yourself and if you could tell us a bit about Neighborhood North. And thank you. Um, I'm Christine Kroger, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I'm actually at our Children's Museum, and we have a drumming workshop going on downstairs. So if you hear anything in the background that, you know, just feel free to clap along. Um, but yeah, I um, we started a Children's Museum called Neighborhood North Museum of Play out here in Beaver Falls. Um, it just as a response to some educational inequity that we noticed in our community. Um, and just speaking to um, the use of data, it, um, our, our program, actually our project started um, in response to the data that I had um, been a part of a, a three-year grant um, with the school district. And I was working at um, the library at the time and then um, Head Start program. And so we, were, we had a community innovation zone um, grant and just um, ha had been working in that, in that space and um, saw that we were not meeting some of the markers in the community. And so um, wanted to bring in a, a resource to the community that would respond to um, some of those early education needs and parent engagement. Um, and so just the way that we use data in our community is that um, 
Well, I guess that was my question. But so we have a children's museum um, in Beaver Falls that is really um, focused on equity um, and justice and bringing in play as a response to that. And that will um, have parents and kids together um, there. We're really art focused um, and bringing in teaching artists as well. Um, and during COVID, we were able to open and run learning pods. Um, and that was a really uh, great way to respond to our community. Yep. Thanks, Christine. Could yeah. you tell us a little bit more about, uh, you know, you, you shared a bit about your the origins of data in terms of really uh, providing the foundation for why Neighborhood North was, was necessary, but since you've launched, in what ways has data shown up in your work and how has it helped you as a, a leader to, to make you know, better decisions to strengthen the organization? Thanks. Um, yeah, so I think because of that, I did, because we were starting a museum, which is actually um, a known institution in other places, I think that's where we're thoughtful yeah. well, and um, not making assumptions that it will be a good fit for Beaver Falls. Um, and so we are careful to um, test and listen. We started as a museum without walls and um, brought in community yeah. and conversations with us um, and responded to, to those needs, um, just making sure that um, Although we're using a, a, a new model, that it's it's responding to our, our community as well. Um, and like I said, during COVID, we were able to adjust that our 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 vision is to educational equity. So um, educational equity. So we were able to actually use um, data from our school districts and actually like both um, qualitative and quantitative data. Um, so both talking with our kids and actually doing hard data like Dibbles testing. See, like our kids, you know, we think our kids are not. Um, we think there's not equity here. We think they're not doing as well, but actually having that real hard data to um, make a case for it, to really advocate for what we think is, is possible. Um, and then actually um, having the outcomes of saying, if you bring a teaching artist into these spaces, kids are actually performing better. And so having having those, having actual um, data outcomes after a year, a year of putting um, work into it was really helpful. And working with outside organizations who, who that is their work, um, partnering with people like Duquesne University, um, partnering with people like um, RAND and um, Center for Reimagining Education and having them come into our space and um, do, do assessments of our work was, was important for us. Um, yeah. So using that in multiple ways, um, as well as bringing, making sure that our, our community voices, that the kids were a part of what we're doing as well as well as, well as their parents. Great, thank you so much. Uh, these are gonna be quick hitters and short conversations. Um, Christine, thanks so much for joining us and sharing a bit about your work at Neighborhood North and how you've been incorporating um, data. Um, if one of the NSR team members, if you wouldn't mind grabbing the link for the Neighborhood North uh, data story report or the show from the website, uh, maybe you could drop that into the link. And if anyone wants to learn more, uh, they'd be able to do so. All right. So power in numbers uh, really started for us. Uh, our inception since 2005 was to help under-resourced organizations and communities uh, increase their capacity to absorb uh, different types of capital. Initially, it really is financial capital through our fiscal sponsorship model. Um, many people we've supported have really gone on to make great impact and grow within their communities. But uh, as we stated earlier, uh, we see this need to really accelerate progress um, at the community and systems level uh, if we really want to achieve uh, equity and sustainability. And so uh, we, we really feel the social sector can take steps to be more effective. So we expanded our thinking uh, working alongside folks like Riverwise, who you'll hear from uh, here in a bit, um, to think about additional forms of capital. And so uh, in addition to financial capital, which is the, the primary driver, honestly, if we think about the data that nonprofits typically make decisions on and many times are incented to report on, you know, is primarily our financial capital. Uh, but we really think more broadly, uh, and we think there are opportunities and untapped resources um, or assets around intellectual, social, and creative capital. And so in 2019, we really started to explore that um, data and advocacy uh, through this Power in Numbers initiative. And uh, the, the three primary components of that are the, the tech platform, um, the creative advocacy playbook, and 
something we've been doing for a while now, which is capacity building uh, around collaborations. And so uh, with that, I'm happy to bring in uh, one of our longest standing partners. Um, as I said, we talk about uh, information and, and knowledge as this untapped asset for nonprofits. And uh, Michelle Walker of Walker Philanthropic Consulting has been uh, really the person that both seeded this as an initial idea for New Sun Rising and has continued to be a, a research thought partner um, throughout our development. So Michelle, uh, if, you, if you could maybe introduce yourself uh, briefly and if you could tell, uh, tell us a bit about you know, how you think about nonprofits as, as knowledge centers and you know, kind of what is the difference between maybe the traditional way that nonprofits position themselves and what it really means to be a knowledge center. Sure. Uh, well, thanks for having me here today. This is actually really exciting to get to talk about this. Um, so I'm Michelle Walker. I'm the founder and principal of Walker Philanthropic Consulting. My work is grounded in research that I did uh, around um, intellectual property within nonprofit organizations. And that sort of led me down this pathway, um, like many other big thinkers in the nonprofit sector around what is it that we're missing um, to help organizations actually achieve their mission and achieve the impact they're looking to see in communities. And I landed on some sort of um, undiscussed and unresearched uh, data around all of the intangible assets of organizations. And so um, sort of the broad picture is that beyond the financial balance sheet and the financial assets, which are critical for doing work, there are, as Scott mentioned, a wealth of resources that are intangible that are just as important for organizations to, to understand and manage and leverage for impact in their communities and towards their mission. And so to that point, um, Scott, around your question about why I refer to them as knowledge organizations. So most organizations do provide some sort of product or service. And I always say most because I'm always waiting for that person who comes up with the one example where there's an organization that provides neither products nor services. But that said, if we zoom out, there are two sort of broader care, uh, categories of firms. There's production firms, organizations, companies that make physical, tangible goods that they sell to consumers. And then there are professional firms, um, CPAs, lawyers, um, any kind of service that you might imagine purchasing to support your own individual needs. And I feel from my research that most nonprofits actually fit into the professional services category, right? We, we do a lot of work working directly with people or groups of people to solve sort of higher order problems that aren't about buying a new car necessarily. If, if an organization is providing a service to help an individual purchase a car, it's usually for some sort of economic solution or change in their life. And so in, in falling more in that professional firm side, sort of the way professional firms are organized is around the knowledge of the people who work inside of the organization. And so most, most importantly, the success of professional firms is driven by the knowledge of the people who work inside of it or beside it. So when I think about nonprofits, I think about what is the information and knowledge that the staff are generating. And Scott, your example of working directly with the elderly in physical therapy is a great example of that. You know, you were first on site adjusting the, the plan for that individual's rehabilitation. And that is a perfect example of the individual knowledge that exists in nonprofit organizations that leads to, okay, how do we improve the services we're providing by thinking about our individual touch points with clients and stakeholders? Great, and, and since nonprofits have access to so much of this information, um, you know, it really is at our fingertips and all around us, and we have these nodes of, of all of these touches, um, why, for the nonprofits and the funders and thinkers and on the, the webinar here, why is it important for them to think about building that capacity and, and tapping into that as a resource for their organization? So I think there's two main strands there in your question. One, data is a way to refine 
products or programs and services that nonprofits offer. So actually using direct feedback, whether that's captured just through um, staff stories and staff um, experiences on, on the job or through actual quantitative measurement and, and reporting that gets collated into a larger, broader picture about impact. Both of those things are very valid and make a difference when you think about when you measure it and then you manage it, you then make changes that um, hopefully improve the service delivery or the service impact. On the, the second strand of that, data is crucial as an intangible asset. So collections of data around um, who you're serving, what the impact of the product service or program has been actually leads to this larger sort of, and I'm probably using the wrong term here, but metadata around what is happening in communities and how can our organization make the case for broader systemic change at the institutional or government level supported by our own data collection and our own knowledge about what's happening in communities and the people we serve. Wonderful, thank you. And again, these are all gonna be, you know, just enough to make you want more, but we're, we're gonna to have to keep moving. Uh, Michelle, thanks for uh, whetting our appetite around the importance of, uh, of knowledge capital and as an asset uh, within nonprofits. Um, as we've been working through this uh, as an organization, you know, we've been uh, reminded both from the workforce development side, um, the uh, evolution of tech, but also in the, the use of tech and um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, a lot of, of uh, the different components of how technology and data are being leveraged. And it's, you know, when you really look at some of the future forecasting, um, how equity shows up or inequity shows up in data and technology will largely determine our future. And so one of the ways that our data culture has, emer has evolved as New Sun Rising is, is actually developing this do no harm with data statement. Um, and I'm not gonna read this to you, but the link at the bottom here, um, again, if maybe someone from our team can drop this into the chat, uh, the Urban Institute re released this do no harm guide, which is just a fantastic resource uh, for you as an organization or as a practitioner to think about how the idea of equity uh, and potential harmful practices with data um, may show up in your work and would encourage you to uh, be having those conversations with, you know, with the folks that you're partnering with and, and those that you're serving. Um, with that, one example of regional efforts towards greater data alignment and transparency is a network called Discover, and this is uh, coordinated through Sustainable Pittsburgh. Um, I've served on the uh, advisory board of, of this um, initiative for a long time uh, with longstanding uh, partner Lydia Morin of Connect. And I'm wondering, Lydia, uh, there's Lydia. Uh, Lydia, welcome. Uh, Again, we're running a bit behind on time, and I know we, we talked about keeping these short, but if you could maybe just give us a, a, a brief overview of what uh, Discover's uh, doing and you know maybe what it is, that way folks can dive in a little bit deeper uh, if they'd like to learn more. Yeah, no, thanks so much for having uh, Discover on the agenda. Um, Connect has been working with Sustainable Pittsburgh, the Western PA Regional Data Center, Urban Kind, New Sun Rising and the Forbes funds, and actually multiple dozen of organizations since 2020 on this kind of multi-sector effort as a measurement project and as a network of organizations attempting to measure and manage data and do something with it. Um, ultimately the doing something with it sort of depends on all of us doing and saying the same things at the same time for that regional impact. So we wanna create these shared narratives um, especially around sustainability for the region. So um, we I guess we're talking about today so far, the network has developed regional targets for six of the 17 UN SDGs, from education to inclusion, from affordable clean energy to air quality, and uh, 
So we're like developing strategies around data collection and communications um, among a lot of different types of nonprofits, really different. And so um, it's our kind of, it's, a, it's an absolutely transparent, inclusive exercise, but just because of how many different organizations there are and are touching these things, it really, um, it really benefits a lot of us that there's some kind of database or way for us to communicate in a whole big group. Um, and for Connect, we have this multi-municipal climate action plan. And, um, you know, it's an example of how our, most of our municipalities don't have the capacity maybe for the data collection and to develop the narrative around the data that it takes to get the money to do the thing. Um, Equitable and Just Greater Pittsburgh is similar where they're bringing together lots of uh, lots of uh, community groups and leaders around you know, creating a more equitable and just region. And so lots of these networked efforts exist. And the question really is, is how do we agree on metrics so that we can see what a regional impact is? Right, it's really hard for us to talk about a regional impact if we're all measuring different things and we're not speaking the same language. And it's very true in local government the same way it is with all of our uh, community organizations and other NGOs. So I'm very excited about this platform and thrilled to be here, Scott. Thanks. Thank you, Lydia. And I just I love this headshot. You're just power pose, boss, <laughs> boss lady. Uh, in nature, Scott, that's why you like it. <laughs> that's, I'm sure that's why you're looking so strong there. Inspired. All right. Thank you, Lydia. So turning, um, turning the page a bit, you know, what is this Power in Numbers initiative? And so uh, we had talked about the vibrancy portal as the technology aspect of this, uh, the pillar and the creative advocacy playbook. And uh, really the goal here is to make data more accessible, democratize data insights, um, integrate data across multiple sets, and uh, ultimately with the goal of making it more actionable. And so this, this idea of actionable uh, data modeling is, is something I'm becoming more and more intrigued with. Uh, it's not, you know, the problem isn't that we don't have enough information. We've already uh, crossed that bridge earlier. It's asking the right questions about the data and then knowing actually what to do with those insights. And so with an actionable data model, what we're really uh, you know, helping people to think through what are the goals? You know, what is that overarching goal that you're uh, working toward? What are the conditions experienced by people and communities in relation to that goal? Uh, what is changing in the lives of, of people as a result of your, your product, program, or service? Uh, turning the lens inwards, how are you performing as an organization, uh, operationally and otherwise? And and then how can you align that effort with others? So what does engagement and collaboration look like? Um, all of these are data points that are disparate and often siloed and rarely brought, to, brought together in what we're posing as this actionable data model. And the Vibrancy Portal uh, helps us take some steps to do that. So again, reflecting on your own work, um, you know, does your data model represent these areas is, do you have clearly stated goals? Are you measuring impact and performance? Does it directly inform uh, the data, directly inform your outreach and engagement uh, strategies? And are you uh, intentional about strategic collaborations based on that data? Uh, and so we will now switch over to demo the Vibrancy portal. So give me one second here while I pull this up. Right. Okay. So this is now live at vibrancy.newsunrising.org. Uh, this is uh, a, a revision of uh, both the user interface, but also the data sets behind uh, what we're offering publicly to, again, uh, you know, primarily 
under-resourced organizations, project leaders, communities, municipalities who um, may not have a data scientist, may not have a lot of data experience, but could leverage the power of data to make the case for the work that they're doing and be more competitive uh, for resources and funding. Um, we start up here with just identifying the location. So I'll put in a few. Uh, we work in Millvale and Belts Hoover. Uh, we do some work out in McKees Rocks and we have expanded this tool actually to uh, Beaver County as well. So I'll enter Aliquippa in there. So one of the things you'll see is that it's populating these community snapshots, which give us a sense of the size, population, uh, and some of the high level you know, census uh, available data around the, the racial makeup of the community. Uh, the second step here is around identifying the, the issues or indicators that you're most interested in. And so uh, you'll see in the drop down here, we're covering a lot of different ground, uh, everything from housing to education to uh, jobs. There's uh, 50 different indicators that are available at the census level uh, that we've uh, brought into this tool. Um, and so we'll just grab a few of those. We'll say uh, employment and education. one more, Let's say green space. Um, and so if you've noticed the, actually the, the heat map itself is changing uh, based on the indicators that we're selecting. And so on the top right here, uh, you'll see what the colors are telling us. Um, so census tracts that are white are in the lowest 20% of, of all of the census tracts up to the darker brown, which are the ones that are scoring in the highest. Um, below that, it shows us which of the sustainable development goals are actually being incorporated into this. So right now we're looking at a heat map of education, work, and land. Um, and as you would change the indicators, you would see these change as well. Um, so at the bottom here, the third step is really around the analysis. And so this is where the tool is uh, taking these available uh, census indicators and uh, showing us some comparisons. So at a high level, we're producing this vibrancy index. It's an overall score across all of the indicators that are available uh, within this set. So it's showing us just relatively how these four communities uh, are scoring across that. We have the sustainability, opportunity, and culture indexes that are generated as well. And so it gives us a little bit of a, a more focused lens, again, around that triple bottom line, and might help us to surface some questions. Well, you know, why is McKees Rock scoring lower in sustainability than the other communities? Why is Millvale scoring higher in opportunity? Um, as you drill deeper, uh, you get into the sustainable development goals that actually comprise those indexes. So we're getting indexes around things like education and workforce. And then if we get even deeper still, uh, we can actually pull the granular data uh, around each of these communities in terms of the areas that have been filtered. Um, so again, nested levels from higher to very granular uh, allows you to compare visu visu visually here uh, pretty easily. Um, the download data uh, gets you a CSV of all of the filtered data that you have uh, gone through with the tool. Um, we're also working uh, with uh, Hunter Smith, who's our new lead uh, data analyst and designer in partnership with Trailblaze Creative uh, to uh, start producing uh, these community data reports, which apologies, dropped out of my feed here. Um, but this is a demo, uh, a demo of what reports look like uh, from more of a design standpoint. So we're, again, taking the locations, uh, the primary indicators and giving some people some oversight uh, in terms of what those SDGs and the indicators that are comprising them look like, what the source of that data came from, census, uh, CDC, et cetera. Uh, and then it reproduces the analysis. So again, your higher level indexes and then by community getting into the granular data. 
So this becomes portable, it becomes a PDF that you can then take and have conversations with your community members uh, and, and think about more, uh, more deeply. The tool itself also allows for uh, an asset map layer or an, an ecosystem layer. So again, this is all about action. And so if you are an organization that's looking at comparing communities and you're interested in employment, education, green space, a next logical question might be who's working on these things? And so we have a database on the back end that I'll show you here shortly, but the Vibrancy portal uh, is now also pulling from that asset map and filtering those organizations to give you a sense of who might be some people that you wanna reach out to. You know, Maybe you wanna partner with, maybe you wanna learn more about them. Uh, and so each of these areas allows you to um, kind of go, uh, look look deeper into who that is. Uh, if we have their information, it's hyperlinked. Um, there are some deeper data within the portal that I'll show you uh, here shortly. But that's the, the high level. Again, this is available, publicly available. If you're in Allegheny or Beaver County right now or not, uh, you can get in and kick the tires. Um, we are so open to feedback and so open to how to make this better for everyone. Um, but please help us to spread the word and, and how people can uh, start to apply this in their own work and help them to make a stronger case. Um, so you'll see up here on the top, there is explore, manage, and about. Um, the about page does take you to some deeper information about the tool. Uh, one place I would draw attention to is this community indicator data list. So if you are a data nerd and want to learn more about you know, what's behind all of this, uh, we'll take you to this uh, spreadsheet where you can get deeper into all of the nuts and bolts uh, behind this. We've also highlighted some areas uh, where we're looking for more census level data. And so we're inviting people to help us uh, build those out. Back to the portal, uh, the manage section is really about empowering organizations and collaboratives to, to manage their own data. And so we're supporting a number of folks uh, to actually collect, analyze, and report that information. Uh, here is New Sun Rising's vibrancy portal uh, uh, profile. Um, it, uh, one of the ways that we're also helping is around uh, impact data collection. So we're working with SOPACT Impact Cloud is our partner as our uh, impact data collection tool. And so we're able to collect uh, help organizations and collaboratives to collect their impact data, um, produce these uh, insights, and then actually have those uh, graphs and charts available. And again, uh, this is something that Hunter's helping us to build out and uh, make available for people that we're supporting. We have people uh, self-assessing their capacity uh, through the OAT, which is our organizational assessment tool gives a real high snapshot in areas that you're excelling or maybe areas that you want to, to dive deeper and work harder on. Um, helps you to compare your organization with others that have taken the OAT. And so you can really drill deeper, you know, how are you comparing around each one of these issue areas or, or operational areas? Um, and then you can filter. If you're an organization that's primarily working on partnerships and capacity building, maybe you just wanna see how do I compare against those organizations. Um, and then you can look based on the size of the organization as well uh, to filter out those budgets. Um, there is a collaborative uh, tool within the, the portal uh, manager itself. So again, this is another look at the ecosystem map. Um, if you're an organization working on hunger, health, and well-being, you might want to just pull out those organizations. Um, the in-app feature actually gives you a little deeper uh, access to their mission, website, um, et cetera. So you can kind of uh, target some folks to reach out to and, and build your impact. So all of this data comes together in something that we call a data story report. And uh, we're gonna share a little bit more about that here shortly. So I'm not gonna go any further on, on that now. Uh, the last thing I would mention for anyone that's doing more uh, portfolio management. So you may be an intermediary that works and supports multiple organizations. We actually do have a portfolio manager in here as well, where somebody like New Sun Rising can 
look across and say, well, these 60 organizations are, are ones that we're, we're, are in our capacity building programs or we're fiscally sponsoring these organizations gives you some insight into their capacity scores and how they're doing. Um, so you can make better decisions about how you're allocating your resources. So I'm gonna stop uh, on the tour there. Um, please do reach out if you want to have a you know, more focused conversation on anything that uh, we, we just previewed for you. Uh, again, the public facing side of that um, tool is already available. So jump in and uh, tell us how we can uh, be doing better with that. We're gonna turn the page a bit. That was really the, the data side of this and the vibrancy portal. Um, again, want to just give a shout out to the Civic Mapper team for all of their uh, tireless work on this, uh, their, their expertise and just efficiency has been tremendous and helping us to get to the point where we are right now. Uh, so we do know that, uh, again, we're living in these times of transition. Uh, there is this digitization of society, with social media and others that have really created this, you know, highly polarized um, scenario and um, you know it's challenging right it's challenging to get your message out it's challenging to engage in, in productive dialogue um, you know generally speaking a lot of the incentives and algorithms are actually you know designed to 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 be uh, polarizing and pushing us apart in different ways so in order for us to move forward in this we really think we need to strengthen our, our civic muscle, uh, get back to the point where we can we can have conversations and hold space with people that maybe don't uh, don't out of the gate, maybe have the same perspective on things as us. Um, and you know the, the goal is to really help shift paradigms and mindsets that are holding existing systems in place. And so uh, with that, we have has really led us to uh, this idea of creative advocacy. Um, and to, to combat that divisiveness and that siloing and increase engagement and awareness, uh, we are co-developing this creative advocacy playbook with our partners, uh, Riverwise and Daniel Rossi Keen, who will be joining me here in a, in a moment. Um, this playbook will be made publicly available here uh, this summer, hopefully in the next uh, month or so. And while these concepts aren't new, I, I certainly don't want to give the sense that we've, you know, we've come up with a new version of the wheel here. There are plenty of amazing creatives, uh, creative advocates that have been doing this for years. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of their work actually served as foundations in the research we did to, to build this. Um, locally, people like One Hood Media and many others who are um, using their platforms to, um, to, to help advocate around issues that our communities face. What makes this initiative unique is that it's focused on building creative capital as an asset, starting with the nonprofit or starting with the community itself. Um, creative advocacy seated within the nonprofit and the community itself as a starting point that then comes together with creatives to launch these public campaigns. And so with that, uh, welcome to uh, Daniel Rossi Keen. Um, again, Daniel, just a quick note, we're behind a little bit, so we're gonna keep things moving and, and somewhat short. I know you never have anything to say, so that shouldn't be a problem for you. Um, but a, a close eco-district partner, um, strategic partner of New Sun Rising. And Daniel, we've been talking for years about the importance of mindset and narrative formation and how communities develop. Uh, could you help us understand a bit about how Riverwise has embedded this strategy into uh, their work and, and um, the impact on how, they, how you've engaged the community out in Beaver County? Yeah, sure. Appreciate you inviting me along for the ride, Scott, both today and uh, gosh, as you said, for the last handful of years. So Riverwise uh, emerged really uh, at some point in 2018 uh, against the backdrop of a $7 billion petrochemical build out in, in the heart of our community. And we realized uh, in a lot of different ways that we had to very quickly mobilize uh, residents to be responding to this, uh, this set of activities you know, opportunities, challenges, uh, you know, quickly changing conditions uh, in our region. And, um, you know, as we started to do that work and we started to try and organize uh, around uh, sustainable community development, we recognized very quickly that 
um, one of the things we had to change most fundamentally was the way people thought about their role in that process. Essentially, we realized that we could have all the data in the world, we could have all of the money in the world, we could have all of the leaders in the world, but unless we could encourage our residents to start to see themselves differently, um, we were going to have a really hard time moving the needle. And so uh, we decided, partly by accident, partly by, uh, I guess, some level of forethought, to embed a documentarian in our organization from day one to foreground storytelling and really to show the community what was possible, um, where they were excellent, where they were doing things that were forward thinking and forward leaning, and really made our primary strategy, the shifting of community mindset through primarily digitized media. Um, and then as COVID hit, we, you know, we had to even go further in on that strategy. But um, at the heart, we have envisioned ourselves as a, a storytelling organization who uses storytelling as a primary tool of community formation. Okay, thanks for the, the background on that. Um, you know, certainly it's, it's been unique to see Riverwise, um, your trajectory having embedded a videographer and storytelling as a, a key part of, of your development and strategy. And so, uh, you know, the first half of this year, uh, we've spent a lot of time uh, on this, this creative advocacy playbook, researching, developing, and preparing it to, to launch with the community. Um, that project's been in, in partnership and with the support of Trailblaze Creative and um, Asa Ana. As we've come to understand creative advocacy, we've talked about it as a, a public and intentional form of engagement that really uses artistic practice to disrupt prevailing narratives and really strengthen movements. Um, we've come up with these five purposes that really uh, underpin uh, advocacy campaigns. And it's, it's worth noting that we are broadening the concept of advocacy beyond public policy. While public policy may often be uh, a goal uh, or an outcome of a campaign, uh, we're thinking uh, broadly about advocacy. And with these five purposes, which are, are here on the, the screen, uh, to inform, connect, inspire, mobilize, and resource, I'm wondering if you could tell us a, a little bit more about those and if you have any thoughts about how and where those may have uh, shown up in Riverwise's work since you've invested so much in uh, creative advocacy to date. Yeah. Yeah. So on the one hand, you look at this list and it seems, uh, you know, relatively straightforward. You start digging into this and you realize that these are nested uh, elements of what it means to, to create uh, and move forward a community together. So, you know, at the, at the high level, it's you know, just disseminating information, but it's also bringing people together around that information, changing something in their heart and in their mind around inspiring them, giving them tools and opportunities to take that inspiration uh, into a productive set of activities. You know, that, that's really the mobilization piece. And then connecting those to, to resources of all kinds um, that can allow them to do the work of moving from this sort of basic impulse that something needs to be different to a concrete, actionable set of strategies that can make it so. And so, you know, we, we've we've worked through this process in a handful of ways in Riverwise's relatively short future. Um, if you have followed us at all over the last year and a half or so, you'll know that we've talked a lot about the bridges, <laughs> physical bridges in Beaver County um, and trail building. Uh, we've done a pretty concerted effort around trying to get uh, political support for uh, trail building through the heart of Beaver County and done a lot of storytelling around that. Um, we've managed to take an idea that had been kind of lingering in the hearts and minds of residents of Aliquippa for 15 years, a, a community park, and take that from a set of kind of nascent uh, aspirations to now a uh, funded project uh, on the back of the federal appropriations process. We were able to attract almost a million dollars of funding to bring that thing to life. Um, and so, you know, we've taken places where there was a lot of energy and activity and desire and used this process of creative advocacy to, uh, to make those concrete, to introduce decision points for policymakers, for funders, for residents to get behind uh, these things and, and really take data and, and bring it to uh, tangible action in the life of a community. 
Uh, we're doing that more so, and you'll be seeing some more of this if you follow Riverwise in the next month or so. Uh, we are releasing a, a video uh, screening of a, a trip that, uh, that, that Scott and uh, some folks at New Sun Rising and a handful of folks from Beaver County took to Louisiana to uh, help our residents understand some of what's coming as it relates to the launching of this, uh, this petrochemical facility later this summer. And so a handful of different ways, but at, at its core, bringing data to life in the life of a community in tangible, actionable ways. Super. Thanks, Daniel. As usual, I want to talk forever. Um, we're going to keep on moving. Uh, Fair enough. You, Thank you. If you could um, maybe drop a link to the, uh, the video, um, uh, yep. Daniel had mentioned there's a, um, a premiere coming up of a, a short documentary film uh, that's definitely a, a great example of creative advocacy at work. Daniel is part of our creative advocacy uh, activator team. So has been providing some support on, uh, on that work. And uh, yeah, if we have, I think we've addressed most of the questions here. Maybe uh, Daniel, if you're, if you're okay with it, maybe we can spend a few minutes uh, touching base on some of the things that we were planning to discuss. Yeah. So let me just get back to, oh, here we go. Yeah. All right. So good to see you. Good to uh, see you guys. I yeah. hope I'm not gonna, uh, sure. No problem. Um, if you wouldn't <laughs> mind um, maybe sharing uh, yeah, a bit about yourself. Um, I know that you, um, you know, you've introduced yourself before as an artist and a designer. Uh, working now in, in Atlanta uh, through your clothing brand Splash by DKG and uh, Fashion Week uh, called Magic City Fashion Week. And uh, I've you know, really been inspired in the, the short amount of time that we've been able to spend together to learn about how you use art as activism uh, to tell your story and bring more awareness to issues and causes. And um, if you could maybe share a little bit more uh, about how you use your creative voice to lift up, you know, causes and communities. Well, yeah, so like you said, um, I, I literally started my brand almost nine years ago. It was kind of by accident. I was rolling into my uh, senior year of college for community health education. Um, I always envisioned I would work for a nonprofit and um, just kind of push uh, that way. But I started tie dyeing, building textiles on denim, started painting, um, doing all kinds of things to clothes. Never really thought people would take it as serious as they do now, kind of like there's a jacket here in my room. Um, but I realized very, very early on that clothes have a really powerful way of like starting conversations that need to be had. So I've gone on to, you know, host panel discussions, um, do a lot of work in the community just to kind of drum up some dialogue about things that we need to be talking about, like our sexual health, for instance. Um, domestic violence has been a big cause of mine. I had a model who was tragically murdered. Um, one of the nights we actually were hanging out and the guy she had been dating for years um, murdered her. And so I thought, surely, you know, not that many people know so much about domestic violence or like, what are the things to look for? I didn't know she was even being abused. So I like to to, um, even though it was a very tragic situation to try to turn things into an educational moment. Um, like I said, I'll never understand why people listen to me and value what I have to say. But since they so graciously give me their time and, and let me talk and, and showcase my art, I have fun with it. Um, I try to lighten some of that heavy stuff um, that can be politics, that can be social injustice. Um, these things are already very heavy, but I feel like in order to get somewhere, in order to truly communicate and take a stab at it, we need to have some kind of common ground, some type of like uh, base to build from. And uh, who knew that could be fashion? So um, I always say artists because I use more than just fashion. Um, I, I use my voice a lot. I am now about to be featured in a bunch of television things. I just did a movie. Um, 
really any kind of space where I feel like I can go in and impact. Um, that is just how I have lived my life. And I feel like that's more of like a, a rock star artist without the check, you know, at least currently anyway. <laughs> Hopefully it's coming. But um, with Fashion Week that you just mentioned, it literally it was like a labor that took every bit of my being out of me, which is why I'm still in my room now. Um, I was actually reading a book. So I hope I wasn't late to join this. I'm so sorry if I was, guys. Um, my head's still in a spin from uh, planning four days of fashion in the city of Birmingham. It's already very hard to communicate uh, in a place like that, that um, is so based on civil rights and things like that. So again, wanting to push art, wanting to push diversity, inclusivity, um, we partnered with Central Alabama Pride. So uh, we were in a parade. We were in um, Pride Fest all day on Sunday. We had beautiful, amazing shows. We were able to bring um, two of the biggest icons in music. One, of, um, one being Madonna. We didn't bring Madonna, but we brought Madonna's makeup artist. And then Beyonce's long-term stylist, Ty Hunter, who is a mentor to me. Um, so being able to call these guys friends, mentors, um, I was able to bring them in and they mentored the designers. We have a new designer now, Aaliyah Taylor, who is amazing. We'll be pushing like uh, plus size and size inclusivity going forward. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I just like to connect with people. I love to talk to people. I love to, to connect. That's really what I love to do and to build community. And like I said, people listen to me for whatever reason. <laughs> and so I, I just use that um to build community and we have a, a a lot of fun there is a a dark side to that because it's very taxing on your mental um over the last i'd say year i've been dealing with a lot of um just a lot of things that reminded me of why i left birmingham and moved to atlanta but uh it just goes into like um it, it comes with the territory of being an artist i guess um you have to take the good with the bad but i'm trying to really balance like how to continue to make change in a space where social is so big and I'm not a super social media person. I mean, I could do it if somebody set it all up for me, but I'm not being bougie, literally. They need to do it and I'll go just, you know, like a, like the news. But I'm trying to figure out like really how best to move forward in that space, being that I also have a 13 year old child. So yeah, that's where I'm at now. And I'll hush, cause I'll probably talk way more than five minutes. <laughs> You're fine. Yeah. And thank you. Um, thank you for hopping on. I didn't, uh, I missed that you were on the tail end of, of uh, fashion week. So uh, I can yeah, imagine. Over. You need Two some, weeks ago. Thank goodness. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, make sure you're um, investing back in yourself, getting your energies back up. Um, one thing we, so in the creative advocacy work, you know, like you had said earlier, you know, there's so much divisiveness and, you know, negativity and polarity and so much of how we engage and interact now and the signals that are being put out that kind of, you know, draw us into that. Um, one of the things with this creative advocacy camp uh, initiative is uh, I had earlier been stating that, you know, a lot of art happens or a lot of activists art happens, but it's initiated by the artists themselves, right? Like you're, you're motivated or called to do something through your art that is in some ways drawing it, you know, awareness, attention, moving some conversation or issue forward. The, the difference that we're looking at with this creative advocacy campaign is that we're really looking to start with the community or the nonprofit themselves and then how they can partner with creatives to actually initiate these campaigns. And one thing I wondered if you had any um, reflections or experiences where, you know, you as an artist, as a creative, were working in collaboration with or in partnership with the community, and you know, maybe how how was that for you? Were there challenges in that? You know, when you maybe broadened out and were working with partners, maybe outside of folks that you had a closer relationship with, um, any words of wisdom around that? Now, see, that's the one that still got me in the chokehold, if I am completely honest with you guys. <laughs> Fashion Week is, uh, so with my clothing brand, it's, it's much easier to collaborate with people. We do a consultation. I can easily say, oh, no, this is not going to work for me. It's not, 
what I do, which I've had to do that a lot. People kind of have very big ideas sometimes. And as big as my ideas are, they just don't align. But when it has come to Fashion Week, um, because you do business in relationships with people, with other businesses, and they may have like, this is our cause or whatever we do. I have kind of found that those have been the biggest challenges to work with. Like one example being Fashion Week this season, working with bigger partners like the museum. There was just so many things that we couldn't do because they're also a nonprofit. And some of that stuff you don't learn until you're eight meetings in. And so I feel like I've gone through a little phase of, of really beating myself up for not for seeing a lot of things that I ended up encountering. Now, when you look back at the photos and the videos, now those shows were amazing. You wouldn't be able to see what I saw. But to me, I almost got back home to Atlanta and thought these shows were tragic, like they were tragic. And I will say the shows were actually three weeks ago and people are still pushing out the content. It's coming up on my phone now. It's like, they're still talking about it. It was one of the most magical things I've ever experienced in my life, but, and them too, I'm sure. If you look at the photos, you, you could just feel it and see it. Um, there's so many partners that are still coming for like future things. Everybody's already planning meetings for what's to come. But me being the person at, at the visionary that's leading the charge, working with so many different personalities, diversifying the, the program and it's growing so fast. It, it's really, can we curse here? But it's really kicking my ass. I'm, that's just no other way to put that. Um, so I have a really good therapist that I've moved up the meetings to weekly. I know I can handle this, but good grief. Like I want to, I almost need like a telescope to be able to see through people <laughs> before I even deal with them. <laughs> but other than that, I absolutely love what I do. It's worth it. It's always going to be worth it, but ooh, people can be people sometimes. And that is, it's extremely challenging. I'm on, I'm still in my thirties. Um, so I'm, I'm figuring it out, but woo, it can, so the, the word of wisdom that I would advise to people is to contracts have been my best friend, um, having those uh, relationships outlined, but there's still things that will come up and you have to just take a deep breath and figure it out. There's just no way around it. Um, it's always, if it's worth it, to me, it's worth it. But I always have a moment at the end of the night where I'm just like, why the hell? am I doing this? Like, and to God, like, why you trusted me to do what? This is insane. And then I still get up and do it every day, like a crazy person. So, but it's, it's always worth it because you're, what, when you're doing something in the world of advocacy, which I think is, is the most powerful, beautiful thing about it. You're literally breaking ground on something for people that you're experiencing one way, but they're probably experiencing from a way of like a lifeline. Like I think of some agencies, if they didn't provide the fresh produce every Saturday, there's some people that wouldn't eat. If, if people couldn't get services through like Ryan White that are HIV positive, they would not be able to function and have a healthy um, lifestyle. A lot of people, they wouldn't be able to get their medications that are, are really expensive. So the advocacy work, um, it has to come from a place where you're truly fulfilled, but I want there to be some other thing that we can go to like a spa or something and just get the zap back. Cause that, it really kicks your ass working with. I work with a lot of partners and I want to say they're all sweet. They're just, it wasn't that they were bad people. It's just, it was so exhausting. Just, I've never had to split a vision a thousand ways so many different like I had to speak it out in every language possible in order to get us to where we got it was worth it but it it took everything I had and then I'm gonna say this in the no hush because I'm figured I've answered your question by now I decided to get a new puppy in the meantime because I thought oh wow this is a great idea what an idiot like who does this yeah that's my life right now though <laughs> I'm just being totally transparent with you guys Wow. Well, thank you for sharing uh, in on your experience. And yeah, I think 
I do think that resonates a lot with how we're thinking about this creative advocacy initiative. Um, and it really is a relationship between, you know, a community partner and a creative and how, how prepared those two are to work in a healthy way together. Um, it's, you know, some of that prep work is worthwhile. And I also really like your words of wisdom around the, the ass kickedness that can be advocacy and the fact that, you know, you are pouring out and there needs to be time to recharge and to make sure that, you know, your batteries are, are ready for the next, next conversation. But sounds like everything, as you said, was magical as you look back and that everyone, um, you know, had a, a really memorable time and it will continue to be touched by that. So congrats uh, on another great fashion week. Uh, so as we're kind of, we're, we're winding down the clock here, um, I do want to make sure uh, we, we get into uh, some of the data storytelling. And I'd mentioned this earlier, uh, these data storytelling reports that uh, really look across that actionable data model pull both qualitative and quantitative aspects of that together, and then produces something back for the community, for the organization, or for the collaborative uh, that they can engage people around. Um, and so uh, a couple of examples here, in, uh, a Beaver County organization, a social enterprise, Crop and Kettle, and a fiscally sponsored group, South Hilltop Men's Group, uh, were two of nine organizations that we've taken through this process so far. And it's really, what we've learned, yes, people love the, the beautifully designed, engaging PDF at the end of it, but it's really the process. And you know, the process is the product in many ways for this data work. Um, we have a, a, a wizard that takes people through that process and we use the vibrancy portal to bring in additional data sources. Uh, and then through a number of conversations and meetings, we, we refine that um, into its final version. And so, uh, we'll be able to, to connect people more. We're, we're definitely increased our capacity with the addition of Hunter on our team to be able to produce more of these and, and look forward to um, supporting folks if you think that might be of value to you. Uh, with that, uh, I had the pleasure of earlier this week catching up with Muffy Mendoza of the Brown Mamas community. Um, Muffy and New Sun Rising have been in partnership for a good long while and uh, was really excited to hear some of her reflections on uh, what data storytelling and narrative have meant in uh, her work with Black maternal health in the Pittsburgh region. Uh, Dan, we're not getting any volume. Time now, and I wondered if you could introduce yourself and the mission of the Brown Mamas organization. Sure. My name is Muffy Mendoza. I'm the founder and CEO of Brown Mamas, and we are an organization, we're a social impact organization that focuses on elevating the collective Black mothering experience through community events, tribe building, building safe spaces, all that type of stuff. Great. And I know in, over the last couple of years, we've been having a lot more conversations between our organizations around research and you know how that either has or hasn't changed the conditions of, of the people that we're collectively working to support. Um, in particular, we know that research around uh, health disparities for black women, particularly in Pittsburgh, are you know, really unacceptable and actually are much worse than many places across the country. Um, and even with those facts, we know that little progress has really been made on these issues, um, you know, over the recent years. Can you help us to understand a little bit more um, how you see narratives uh, influencing health and well-being of Black mothers and their families and, and ways that that shows up in the Black, uh, the Brown Mamas community? 
So it's interesting because I think storytelling is something that human beings kind of organically do. We tell ourselves stories about the things that are happening in our lives. We tell ourselves st stories sometimes about things that aren't happening as a way of creating narratives, personal narratives for ourselves so that we can quite honestly live the lives that we think that we're living. And with Brown Mamas, I see that so much in our community um, with moms who are sharing with each other, whether they're sharing information, sharing their stories, just organically on a day-to-day -day basis as a means of feeling validated and also getting advice. Um, and so I think when it comes to creating narratives, it's something that we organically do as human beings, but it's also something that we've been taught to do. Um, we respond to narratives in our day-to-day -day lives, whether it's responding to a stereotype that you believe about yourself or somebody else believes about you. And when it comes to you know health, how we interact with other people is determined by those narratives and those stories that we tell ourselves. So when it comes to black women, a lot of times the narratives and stories that we're hearing from the outside world and that we begin to internalize lead us to not only make decisions that are not necessarily always good for us going against our own self-interest, but also makes us feed into these ideas about ourselves. So a lot of times when it comes to health organizations, black moms feel defeated when they get into those types of spaces because oftentimes they feel like they're not as smart as a doctor. They don't know their own bodies. They don't really understand the medical system and the jargon and things like those, things like that that are being, um, you know, said around them. And so we buy into those narratives. And so that's why it's so important that spaces like Brown Mamas exist because that's what we do. Moms can come into our community and they can talk about these issues and we validate their experiences. We tell them, yes, there are other moms who are having the same experiences or no, you're not wrong about that thing. You may need to get a second opinion. And so it's just really important that communities begin to take hold of their narratives because we know that we are storytelling beings. And so this is what we do by nature. So it's important that the stories that we tell ourselves are accurate or actually in alignment with our interests and that are actually creating communities that we want to live in rather than buying into false narratives that have been told to us from outsiders. Absolutely. And I know that your commitment to helping people tell their own stories is, is an important part of the Brown Mamas community, and it has been. Uh, in particular, uh, a project that's been going on uh, for multiple years now, and I know this this past year was a really special one, uh, just within the, the last month. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the Brown Mama monologues and how uh, that particular event uh, works with your community members to, to accomplish this goal of, of advocacy and awareness and of narrative building? So the Brown Mama Monologues is a six month program as well as storytelling showcase that we do with six to eight moms every year where we find moms who have really unique stories about being a black mother in America and we help them work through their narratives and then we put them on stage so they can tell their narratives to their family members, friends and community members. Um, and the one word that all that I always think about when I think about the Brown Mama monologues is just transform because it is such a transformative process for a mom to be able to come in to an audition, not be sure about her story, not many times not even having processed her motherhood journey and then come out the next, you know, six months later, walk across the stage, tell her story and the look on her face after she finishes is one of exhilaration, is one of ownership and agency, and is just one of excitement for the road that lies ahead now that she's owned and created her own narrative for her own life. And so the Brown Mama Monologues is, crea is creative advocacy, but it's really about creative agency. It's about creating spaces for people to own their own narratives and to begin to take those narratives into their life knowing that they are the owner and the creator and the author of the story of their life. And for black women, you know, a rate we black women are the pioneers, the architects of the American nation for the most part. But we have done that 
mostly by what we've been told to do. We've been told to cook, we've been told to clean, we've been told to work, we've been told to raise children, we've been told to be the backbones of our communities. And many times we've not decided that for ourselves. We've not decided what we want to do for ourselves. And so the Brown Mama monologues kind of pushes that into the dirt and says, no, you need to write your story. You need to own the story of your past and you need to create the story of your future. And so the Brown Mama monologues is, you know, it's an opportunity for black women to become not just, you know, the pioneers of this nation, but the architects, architects of a new future. Yeah, so powerful and helping people to have that, um, you know, that authority, that autonomy and really allowing them to own their stories. You Hopefully know, which, I as you said, the question. <laughs> yeah, no, in many ways, it's, you know, it really is what, um, you know, the future is determined by by the present and by allowing people to state this um, state that future is is so so important um, and so far we've talked a good bit about how uh, the brown mama's community um, how you support your community in storytelling and narrative building and why it's so important to their lives um, this last uh, question really is more so about how you as an organization and you as a leader um, have used these tools of, of data and storytelling uh, around understanding Brown Mamas as an organization itself. And one of the ways that New Sun Rising has, has worked alongside of you is through the development of a data story report. And in that process, we explored the qualitative and quantitative data. And, you know, we kind of talked through in multiple rounds of discussions, uh, you know, where maybe there were gaps in our thinking or where we had to find new information or you know, ways to kind of weave all of this together. And I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more about how that process uh, helped you or how it might have impacted you as a leader um, and what it might have done for your organization as well. So absolutely, I love the data storytelling report. I'm a creative, I'm a creative leader, um, which means that I, you know, of course I have to use numbers and statistics and research in the work that I do, but I also love to be able to see the impact through images, through graphs, through, um, you know, just creative ways to express what we do. And I've used, I've used the voices of my mothers to pretty much fuel everything that I do. Um, I'm always, I understand the responsibility of having a community of 6,500 black moms. And I know that a huge part of that responsibility is that I have access to ask. I have access to ask moms if they wanna have a support group meeting on a Saturday or a Thursday. I have access to ask moms why you didn't show up to this meeting or to this event. So we're always centering the voices, the lived experiences, the complaints and the, you know, the complaints as well as what moms are saying is good about brown mamas as the fuel and driving engine for what we do. And so being able to turn that lived experience, being able to turn those stories into actual data is that's priceless for brown mamas because, you know, we build our authenticity on the fact that we say we listen to our moms. And so there's, there's, there's no study that can prove that we're listening to our moms, but we can do that through taking into account their stories by holding listening sessions, which is something that we just did this year, um, by constantly surveying them. We do that all the time. And those types of things really help us to really stay true to our mission of listening to black moms and elevating the collective black mothering experience based on putting black moms first. Did I answer your question? I think I did. Absolutely. And some, as always, um, always great insight. It's always great to talk with you. Thank you so much for spending some time with us, um, you know, in advance of the, uh, the workshop on Wednesday. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you share where, uh, you know, folks on the webinar, if they wanted to learn more about Brown Mamas, where can they find you on the, the web and the social? So you can go to us at brownmamas.com, B-R-O-W-N-M-A-M-A-S.com. You can also find us on Facebook at Brown Mamas, on Instagram at Brown Mamas Tribe. Great. Thank you so much. No problem, Scott. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead. All right. 
So um, you can see why we love Muffy so much. She's so insightful, um, powerful, just has has the the intuition and her hand on the pulse of so much that's happening. Um, she's been a really great partner in helping us to to think through these things and and honestly to create some of the data story approaches. I know we're at two thirty, uh, which was the time that uh, we had allocated for this. A uh, couple quick slides to run through. If anyone wants to stay for overtime, be happy to do so. Uh, we will look at the chat. If you have to hop off, but you have a question you'd like us to address, please drop it in the chat. We'll make sure that we follow up with you. Uh, over the past two years, this is what we've done. Uh, this is what uh, power in numbers has looked like from an impact standpoint. We're engaging with people. We're producing these data story reports. We're building collaborations. We're helping uh, leaders to explore their community data and analyze their, their organizational data. Uh, people are managing their budgets and their financial activity uh, through the technology that we have and analyzing uh, their capacity as well. Um, I know we're a little short. I'm going to skip past this and come back to um, the Q&A. Uh, but in terms of what's next, the portal is, is available. It's a dynamic ongoing project. We will continue to iterate. We'll continue to build it out uh, as, as we're able to bring more resources to bear, but we, we look forward to your input on that. Uh, we do have gaps in the data that we know are uh, important for the communities that we're working with. So please help us to, to identify or even think about ways to approach that. One of those gaps is the recognition that the majority of the data that we make our decisions on and that our institutions make decision on is institutionally collected data. And so we want to think more about participatory data and how communities themselves can contribute uh, the context around their, their information. And so this participatory data modeling is something we'll be expanding into with the project. We're already doing some machine learning around the sustainable development goals, really thinking more and more about predictive modeling and things like how to uh, help people uh, have more effective collaborations. Some of the work we are doing with KIT, uh, with GISPIA um, in this last semester, really building upon that. The Creative Advocacy Playbook will be released. So we'll make sure we have all of your information. We'll make sure that you all are amongst the first to know about that. We'll also be launching campaigns, uh, Riverwise, New Sun Rising, but also uh, supporting partner campaigns as well. The data story reports, we're moving towards more automation within the Vibrancy portal to help people take that data and turn it into things that they can actually report on uh, with you know, a, a little less effort. Uh, and we're in conversations with the, the grant making community. Uh, we really think, uh, and we've heard from them, that a missing piece of this conversation and relationship between grant makers and grantees is the contextual side of what's been learned uh, and the relational and qualitative side of it. So uh, continuing to explore what some of that might look like. How can you help this project? Use the tools, uh, give us feedback, uh, help us co-design these things, um, raise awareness amongst your partners, your uh, the community that you may fund or partner with. Um, we're looking for data partners. So we do have folks at, at Carnegie Mellon and Pitt and others who have have joined in the effort. Um, we, we know that people who do specific work in areas may have access to data sets that uh, others may not be aware of. Um, strategic introductions, if you know someone that's doing related work, we'd love to have a conversation. And it wouldn't be a nonprofit presentation if we didn't have the hat out and ask for funding. Uh, this work is not the easiest to resource and fund. Um, it's, it is research and development, it is future looking, it is uh, on a longer time frame often than the one year um, funding cycle that traditionally is, is um, resourced. We feel like we have good, a good uh, foundation and we've been able to, to, to make some progress on this. Uh, if you are or know of a funding partner who works in this space, uh, we would love to have a conversation there as well. And again, the info at New Sun Rising is the best place to catch us. So. I'm going to back up and we'll leave it on the Q&A screen again. Uh, feel free to get into your day. An hour and a half is a long, long time. Uh, your gift of being a part of this is, is not overlooked. 
um, get outside, breathe some fresh air, uh, get inspired by nature. Um, but I will be hanging out uh, for anyone that would like to continue the conversation and uh, we can start looking into the, the Q&A um, and maybe starting with some of the, the questions that came up in the chat. So uh, Dan Steiker, I don't know if you if there's anything in there that you saw that I should maybe address first. I just put it into the chat. All right. Um, let's see here. It might be getting buried in in the other chats. Uh, could you could you just read it out to me? Yep. Uh, this is great. Very useful. Are you seeing results of this information for getting impact investing or corporate reaching out for community development projects? And I think this is from our partners um, from uh, SOPAC. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, I, I think Daniel touched on this a bit. The uh, I would say the the most tangible and and significant success uh, around the the marriage of creative of data and creative advocacy was around our ability to respond to a federal funding opportunity um, where there are uh, seven project sites um, across Allegheny and Beaver County that were supported through this work to respond to a community project funding opportunity, uh, which amounted to uh, three and a half plus million dollars across these project and partner sites. Um, Riverwise uh, really did a lot of the, the heavy lifting in terms of leading the way, um, creating uh, portfol online portfolios and just ways to really uh, inspire the uh, investors in terms of why they, they were good projects to invest in. So that would be the, the example I would point to um, from the, not so much from the corporate standpoint. And, you know, we, I think we have a, uh, definitely have a long way to go in terms of the uh, engagement and the external advocacy around this work. So that's really the phase that we're at now is, um, is in that engagement and advocacy. And yeah, hope to use that to unlock additional resources and relationships. Will ask two questions. One, how often does the data get updated? And then he has one from Sarah. What's the difference between revision one and this version? Sure. So uh, this data set was up was last updated two years ago, and so that was a a. Um, uh, part of a student project that created the initial data set that we've since gone back in and, and updated. Um, a lot of that was inspired or, or triggered by the census, the new census data, CDC data um, that was made available here yeah, recently. Um, the, uh, and this bridge is actually Will's question or Sarah's question about the difference between this and the previous version. Uh, the previous version was a separate app that was not integrated with the whole back end data architecture that we currently have as part of this portal. And so with that, uh, the Civic Mapper team has really helped us establish a database structure to ingest and update data in a lot more efficient um, and low, low cost and low barrier ways. Um, and so those data APIs, the way that we've been able to connect with those data sources, whether they're or, uh, you know, federal or otherwise, um, or allow us to make that make those updates a lot more uh, frequent and a lot more dynamically. Um, imagine you know some of these uh, will be tied to the the ACS, the American Community Survey data, which is is updated more frequently. Um, the spreadsheet that we shared uh, will constantly be updated with the the most current source of the data that's being displayed. Uh, but we see, we definitely see we're in a, uh, I would say, I think we've been calling this a 3.0 version of the vibrancy index. Um, we're already uh, identifying new sources and, and new um, sets that we want to bring into this. So. Um, other things, uh, Sarah, on the, the revision, uh, in addition to the, the uh, expansion into Beaver County, uh, we actually, um, did a lot on the UI itself. And of course, um, Sarah and her team uh, 
with, with Cassie and the students that we worked with were really great at giving us honest feedback about the usability. Um, and a lot of that, uh, that uh, functionality updates did show up in this version. Uh, we are wrapping up, we're into overtime now. So uh, we're wrapping up this session. Uh, we are gonna close it out at this point uh, for everyone that was able to attend. Um, this was recorded, so as people come across this, um, certainly please feel free to reach out um, to any of our guests. Um, and again, us at info at newsunrising.org. Thanks for everyone that attended, all the guests that spoke today, and um, also looking forward to your feedback on the work we're doing uh, through the Power in Numbers initiative related to both our vibrancy portal data work and also the creative advocacy playbook as that gets released. So thanks again.